So I am so glad to have kind of reason back in my life, and they're doing amazing things. The object synth is groundbreaking, next level. It still hurts my brain. I, and I've watched your tutorial like several times. I'm like, I, it was so lucid, and now it is gone. <laughs> So I got to watch it again at half speed, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, object um, is, you know, I mean, physical modeling, it's a, it's, it, it is a, a true physical modeling synthesizer. And that's probably the, the type of synthesis technology that we all have the least experience with, you know. What is happening, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the 52Qs podcast, your weekly insight into all things production and library music. Whether you're simply curious about the sync industry or maybe you're ready to pitch to publishers, I promise you, you are in the right place. My name is Dave Croft, and it is so good to be with you today. And if you find this video helpful, then why don't you give it a thumbs up here on YouTube or a five-star review in your podcast app. And please be sure to subscribe because I talk about library music like all the time. Today's episode wouldn't be possible without the incredible support of our member subscribers at 52Qs who not only keep the community alive and thriving, but as members, they also get access to extra features like workshops, live streams, office hours, queue breakdowns, Zoom feedback sessions, hundreds of hours of archives, and opportunities to submit to real music library. So uh, maybe this sounds like you, and or maybe you're feeling stuck and ready to take your sync career to the next level, then why don't you head over to 52Qs.com. It's free to join, and memberships start at like four bucks a month. We would love, love to have you. So it is week three of 2024, and how's it going? My weekly check-in, and I gotta say, it's going really well. Finally, on the other side of the holiday, finally getting some traction. I'm wrapping up an album, got more albums on, on deck, and it's just going really, really well. Finding a new pattern, right, in my calendar. I've taken on more responsibilities, and I've actually gotten a promotion over at Full Sail. So excited about that, but it means that I have to be a lot more deliberate with my time. So there are chunks where I'm writing and chunks where I'm answering emails, chunks where I'm in class and all these kind of things. And I'm just being really deliberate with those times in my calendar and just being kind to myself if if I don't stick to it, right? right? It's really easy to kind of set something up and say, this is what I'm going to do. And then if you don't do it, whether it's managing a calendar or whether it's exercising or dieting or whatever, and you can get into this mindset where you're kind of beating yourself up. And, and I think that's self-defeating. So, so I'm going to be kind to myself. I'm going to do the best I can with the time that I have and, uh, and be okay if, if, I, if I don't hit, hit my target. That's totally okay. Next week, I'll try to do better. But I'm being really deliberate, scheduling, and getting the most out of my writing times. And I felt like this year has been really, really productive. It's week three, and I've already got five cues down. So things are going really, really well. Some of that is motivated by having to deliver uh, several cues by the end of the month, but also Expedition 52. So the cue that I'm writing this week for the Expedition 52 check-in, uh, it's called Loch Ness Lookout, and it is a, an Irish or a Scottish or a high, I called it Highland Tension. Right, so it, it's uh, using Yulian pipes. It's using this kind of Celtic vocal type sound and boron uh, samples and boron recordings. So uh, this is my Q4 2000, uh, week four, 2024 Expedition 52. This is Loch Ness Lookout. <laughs>
that was Loch Ness Lookout. And if you want a breakdown of this cue, then uh, tune in to the cue breakdown on Friday or tomorrow at uh, over for the Friends subscribers. I've got a complete breakdown of that coming right up. If you've watched any music production tutorials out there on the internet, whether you like Reason or you use Reason or not, I guarantee you, you've at least heard this man's voice. My guest joining me today is a singer, a songwriter, producer, music educator, the senior creative lead at Reason Studios. I am so happy to welcome to the podcast, Mr. Ryan Harlan. Ryan, what is happening, my man? How are you doing? Thanks for having me. That's a good little good little wind up there. So uh, yeah, I'll, yeah, yeah. I'll clip that out and just make that my alarm each morning. And <laughs> your ringtone, yeah. right? Ooh, Get myself going. going. <laughs> <laughs> so from one YouTuber to another, from one you know uh, eyewear aficionado to another. Uh, no, it's game recognizing game. Is, is what it is. <laughs> right. Okay. But, but I got to tell you, I've been a, a longtime fan of yours. Back long before we you know saw your face, you were really the voice of reason. I, well, you know, it's it's funny. It, it, I guess uh, in some sense, thank you for saying that. Um, it's funny to uh, hear that because when I came in, when I so I my my journey with Reason and the content that I did with them is uh, for a number of years. I was writing the content, but it was being narrated by that we had a voiceover artist mm -hmm. named Frank, and he gotcha. would do uh, all the stuff, and he was referred to as the voice of Reason. And then, uh, okay. because of certain logistical reasons, both in sort of the tone and the, the the way that the script was going, there was one of them where I thought, you know what, actually it makes more sense for it to be my voice doing this and not sort of the authoritative reason voice, the generic reason voice that right. they knew. Right. Uh, and let me tell you, uh, the revolt in the comments when that switch happened because who is this voice he's not the voice of reason you know we need frank back it was a whole oh whole gosh. thing and so uh and and for a little while i i kind of would do both some stuff i would do mine some stuff we'd, mm. we'd use frank and then uh, over time it, it started to transition and the real transition happened when youtube transitioned to you can't be a faceless person anymore you you know we want to know the personality and so that was sort of the the real kickoff to be like all right i gotta I got to get one of these things here and, yeah, you know, uh, yeah, and actually, lights and camera. And yeah, the whole, exactly. And, I mean, my, my, you know, my, this is my living space and working space. And it's really become just a live in YouTube studio that I, you know, <laughs> yeah. bargained with myself to fit a bed in there somewhere, you know? Yeah, absolutely. This is, uh, this is my production studio. It's just a room over a garage and uh, like some Amazon lights, you know, and I researched and found like a good camera, but it's not. It's not like a red camera or anything crazy like that. Just to make it look a little, you know, I'm about to ask you to sit there and watch me for, I mean, these podcast episodes can go an hour at a time. The least I could do is do a little bit of research on my lighting. <laughs> exactly. Right, right. No but hard man, shadows, you know. Uh, nice yeah, exactly. Cool Key background. Lines. We have a fill light and yeah, a right. overhead and a hair light. Yeah, I went, I went all in. Isn't it that. funny that, you know, the things that you, you know, all of us, this is true, I think, for everyone uh, that, that probably would watch and listen to this, is that you know, the skills that you didn't expect you'd have to build just to do the skill that you want to do, you know? It's like, I, I remember early on when I was in college for audio engineering, and we had a, a studio owner, local studio owner, a big studio in Liverpool, England, uh, came to talk to the students. And uh, his the big advice he stuck that stuck with me was he said, listen, uh, you're going to go out into the world, you guys might start studios, you might start business enterprises with other business partners, Figure out which one of you is going to end up doing the thing you don't want to do because that's what's going to happen. One of you is going to become the accountant and the marketer and you know the the event planner, and then the other yep. guy is going to get to do the stuff that you were trying to get that's in on. Right. So you, yep. You know, Some, like, somebody's scooping out cat the cat box, right? Yeah. Somebody's got to do that. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, and uh, I'm I'm really excited about the uh, democratization of some of the tools. Like if you were to rewind ten years ago in the video production space. Like these lights, which which I got for like sixty bucks for a whole set of lights, I would have had to go into like a photo store. Yeah, I would have had to drop all kinds of real money on these. Absolutely. And uh, I mean, they're not heirloom lights. I mean, I'm not handing them down to my great grandchildren, but um, they work really well. They work really well. So, you know, it's uh, I can I can speak from experience because I was in the video game ten years ago, and I wasn't. I mean, even you know, fifteen and and sixteen years ago, and. Um, uh, a friend of mine who uh, we we did a lot of our early documentary production work together, and 
we used to have this thing when we started out, we had this dream in, the, in life and it was to be, we we sort of referred to it as one trip production. So what it meant was we were, someday we'd be able to unload the car and load into a, a an interview or a shoot in one trip from the car. Mm. Like that was the dream. But of course at that time it was, you know, three, four, five trip productions. Right. Um, and not, you know, just seven years later or something, he and I did a big uh, project with a band where we were touring all around the world and the whole thing was in our backpacks. And it was mm. like such a, a sort of, milestone for us to realize even how far we'd come then and then we started dreaming about i think we started calling it a uh, cargo shorts productions right? like, can we get it down to like how small can we get this you know can i fit it in a fanny pack <laughs> yeah. right that's... and you know it's actually i mean some of the video stuff is crazy what's happening right now there's a new thing that just came out recently called the the osmo uh, pocket osmo the newest generation of that it, the thing is you know looks like a pez dispenser and shoots video that's better than a lot of the entry level kind of dslr and, uh, and i know i mean uh, not to mention the thing that we all have in our in our I, in our pocket absolutely absolutely yeah. yeah and and so like this camera right here is a dslr camera with a with a with a nice lens on it but it's like that big right yeah full movies are are shot on these cameras which look like like mini cam, like those little, uh, what, those disc cameras, you remember those? Yes, right, 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 right. Uh, and you know, the, the thing about this actually, what I think was is sort of exciting and relevant, and certainly to your audience, is with the democratization and the miniaturization of all this technology, what it really is doing is expanding the number of people that are creating this content. That's right. And, and to... To a way that is good for us, the thing that hasn't yet been AI'd and, and cracked and, and redundant, uh, you know, and all that, <laughs> is that a, a quality cue, a quality score, you know, to go with content elevates it in a way that, That's like, right. it's just enormous. So That's right. I'm all in favor of getting these cameras out to as many hands as possible, as many storytellers as possible. That's right. You know? and, and speaking of democratization of tools, this brings me to reason. Now, some 20 years ago, 22 I years right. ago, yeah. I was teaching Reason at a college in Memphis, and I had my choice. I could teach like Pro Tools, I could teach, you know, Digital Performer, all these other things. And I specifically chose Reason because I, uh, I, I am of the age where I still appreciate a good tactile uh, feel, like knobs and faders. I still, e even right over here, I could, I could do all this virtual business, but I run my entire studio out of a physical mixer as far as the live and everything. Yeah. Um, and Reason had that absolutely in spades, and it embraced it. You know, you could flip the back. And, and so Reason was my first kind of big boy grown-up DAW. You know, before it was, you know, Reason with Reason Record and then all of that kind of stuff. Sure. And so um, as a person who has spent countless hours, you, you have put your 10,000 Malcolm Gladwell <laughs> hours into Reason. I probably have, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, you are, are the resident Zen master of Reason. Um, what are some of its biggest advantages that you could see um, mm. that, that might, and this isn't a commercial for Reason, yeah, yeah sure. you didn't pay me to do this or sure, anything, sure, sure, sure. but what, what are some of, some of the things that really kind of drew you to reason and being able to, 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 to pour so much of your creative energy into? That's, I think that's actually, that's great. I'm glad you mentioned, you know, like, this isn't a commercial for it because actually, like, I have to remind myself that when I talk about reason, because I, I am a reason user that through happenstance and luck hooked up with the company and happened to be a video producer and happened to live in Los Angeles when they needed one and then happened to work with them enough that they you know started working with me on a more sort of regular and full-time basis and so so to me that is all like secondary i sort of feel like i there's some loophole trick where i've like <laughs> I got to be a Reason user who gets paid by Reason. It's just it's kismet, like, man. It's you know? kismet. Uh, but I still very much like when I talk to, when I'm hosting live streams and talking to the Reason community or when I, and whenever I go to an event, like I was at Super Booth in May and, and meet with the Reason community, I'm not there as a Reason representative. I'm there as a Reason user hanging out with my my friends, you know, yep. and uh, I still very much think of it that way. So it's always, it's almost weird when I have to think, oh wait, what is, 
what is the official company line on this or what is the what is the marketing <laughs> talking point like i don't that's not my world my world is just as a reason user and so yeah and you're and you're not necessarily here as a represent you're like reason didn't send you like i didn't like no. pitch their marketing and they sent well here's here's ryan yeah right talk to, to our product specialist or whatever yeah, yeah no. right no yeah, no that's no. not what we're doing here i, no. I you're a, a lover of reason uh, a user of reason who like like you said has moved into this so what was it about reason that just resonated with you yeah that's a it's a good question well so in some sense sense i came into reason at the same time you did i was um a a relatively young kid getting into audio engineering in the 90s i was the kid that would you know like the little studio rat that would hang out and be like could i wrap cables and make coffee and just just to be near the action at the right. at recording studios in philadelphia and um because of that I was growing up, I mean, I didn't know it at the time, but I was growing up and training at the tail end of the hardware world, you know? Mm. I learned how to, uh, you know, calibrate a, a two-inch 24-track tape machine and then never used one to actually record because, it, like, by the time I knew how to do it, that was like, that moment had passed. You are me. I took <laughs> classes in college on splicing, like, I took a radio productions class about splicing tape, and I yeah. never got to use it. Exactly, exactly. I, I had that exact same thing. Yeah, yeah. I could I could splice tape really slowly and awkwardly uh, if I had to, but yeah, I, I've never actually done it in practice. And so, um, but what I did come up in is the world of the, well, now we're going to call it the hardware metaphor, but it was hardware. And mm -hmm. so using a patch bay and understanding signal flow via a cable and the, the simplicity of that, that a, a cable has two points. It goes from something to something, and there's no ambiguity about that. And you don't have to right click to see what it's doing. And, you know, you don't have to go into some like routing matrix to make that happen. It's just, it's, it's tactile. It's just that. And so there was this very artful simplicity to the way recording studios worked as I was coming up and learning. But I also was young enough that I was on the, on the entry edge, the sort of that, that bleeding edge of the DAW stuff. So I was, uh, when I was going to school for audio engineering, I was the kid that had Pro Tools 3, which mm. what was what it was at the time. And a little, I can't even remember the name of the card bus technology that you had to put in your computer to make it run, but it was, like you know, it was one of those. or whatever. <laughs> it was a SCSI drive. And then, yep. but there was a name, I, uh, it had, I would, if I Googled it, I'd find it. But there was some name for the special card you had to put. It wasn't a PCI card. We didn't have those yet. It was like something mm. else. Um, but um, yeah, so I was, I was sort of on the early edge of that. And um, when students, we had one class where we were learning, I, uh, I think it was Otari made, a uh, disc-based uh, digital recorder uh, for use. And the idea was we we took a class for learning how to use it for post-production sound, you know, sound effects and slipping things in, uh, dialogue and that kind of stuff. And I started using it to record and produce music. And I remember people thinking it was kind of weird. And I was like, guys, like, I mean, you get it, right? Like I can copy this chorus and paste it over here and I can like loop this part and I can fix this, you know, and there's a lot of things. So so I was I was sort of coming up in this world of cables and hardware embracing the digital and right after i got out of school and kind of entered the world of actually you know professionally making music and uh and and making uh, and recording and producing reason landed and it was what was so brilliant to particularly people of my era at that time mm -hmm. was it was you know what i can now call the hardware metaphor which was mm -hmm. it, it I looked at that and I didn't, I didn't need a manual. I just That's looked right. at it and went, oh, got it. Yep. I mean, the only manual thing you needed to know was you hit the tab key to flip to the back of the rack. Right. <laughs> and then <laughs> once you know that, th then yeah. it, it, the, the routing is it's in, like instinctual. Yeah, so. knobs look like knobs. Faders knobs look, look like, like faders. knobs. Yeah, you yeah, know, the, the compressor looks like the compressor that I have over here, you know, and, yeah. and, and it behaves like it. That's the other thing too. And um, so it just... It just was a this no brainer sort of transition in terms of that. Now, at the time, uh, and and still, you know, I can use Logic and Pro Tools and Live. I mean, uh, Live at that time wasn't quite out and cooking yet, but you know, I I, I dabble in all these DAWs and, and use all these DAWs. But um, what clicked for me at the time that I started using Reason more uh, exclusively or more heavily was that my creative output was more efficient and better working in reason mm. and uh, maybe that might not be true for everyone i don't want to like say the, that like well, it's it's a the, guaranteed the, fix for anyone but yeah the tool the tool and the workflow just resonated with you it and did that's that matters it's it like did. what's yeah. the difference between a, a three thousand dollar yamaha saxophone or a three thousand dollar like selmer saxophone right it's just 
they're both great instruments, but one of them's just going to feel better in your hands. Right. And, and I've thought about that in my, you know, as, as you sort of say, I sort of, in a sense, through my content, become some type of like, you know, avatar, you know, the human <laughs> avatar of the Reason community. And so I think a lot about that question because I get asked it a lot and stuff. And so in the, in the more recent years, I, when I'm working in Reason, I do sort of think about like, well, what is it? What, like, I say it's more efficient for me creatively, but why? What is that? And what I have come to realize is there's certain things about it. Like it's, it's an open blank canvas. It's, the, it's a virtual studio rack on your screen. And so when I drag an instrument in, it just lives alongside the other gear, which is, you know, if someone's not used to that workflow, they might come into that and find that to be almost sort of chaotic where it's like, well, why is this instrument sitting next to this one, but they're on different tracks and they've got different, you know, automation lanes and why, why are they just right next to each other? But for me, it's like, that's a, that's a feature, not a bug that right next to each other, right. I can move so quickly without having to like, keep going back to the sequencer and selecting another, you know, or a channel in the mixer and, and toggling back and forth. And when I use some of these other DAWs, I'm often doing, I'm amazed at how many of these little, like sort of transitional clicks I need to do to like, oh, I got to go back to this other page view to click the channel that I want. Then I got to click the the button to select the plugin that I want to open. And then I got to go down lower here and click the little wrench thing to make the pop. <laughs> and, and it's like that, just that process right there, like great ideas can die in that That's right. fleeting moment. And right. But yeah. Because you're, you're pulling yourself out of the flow state. Right. 100%. And so now this would be like, you know, talking about a saxophone, a saxophone is going, oh, what was the fingering on that scale? Yeah. And now suddenly right. you're not thinking creatively. Now you're I mean, thinking analytically. How many times I'm sure anyone, uh, you know, listening to this, how many times have you had a great musical idea and forgotten it while you're trying to get the voice memos app open on your That's phone? Right. You That's know? right. This is why I keep a microphone uh, plugged in, ready to go at any time. So if I want to go, hey, I need to, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to record Shaker. Yeah. Then I just grab the Shaker, grab the mic, and get go. it. Yeah. So in and that sense, yeah, the, the that open canvas of the Reason Rack, uh, I just move around through it so quickly. Yeah. And so the yeah. and the, the proof is in the pudding. I just make more and better music in Reason. Yeah. And I was that's making. you know I I did a whole episode of a, a video on I called it Doll Wars, like which is yeah. the best doll, and it was yeah. like it was kind of clickbaity. <laughs> Shh, don't tell. Sure. Me. <laughs> Uh, but it's really, you can obviously tell the folks who just read the title and then like, like carpet bombed me in the, in the comments right? versus people who watched the video, because the video says the DAW that you know is the best DAW to use, right? right? There is no right. one DAW, which is like top of the mountain That's or right. any of that. Uh, when I, when I moved to Florida and I took a gig at Full Sail, uh, they're, they're Logic, they're Logic and Pro Tools. And so I sadly had to set Reason aside because I had to go like all in. I was Reason and Ableton. Uh, I did Ableton for a lot of my remix work and that kind of thing and Reason for practically everything else, um, especially before the record days, you know. Yeah, when, right. When, was... when you couldn't record live audio into yeah, Reason. Yeah, it was just the virtual um, instruments, yeah. And, um, but I, the fact that it was a closed architecture, that's what sold me on it to my, to my students in Memphis. I was like, mm. here it is. You don't need any plugins. You don't need any VSTs here. You go make music. Anyway. So I, I kind of, you know, had to set reason aside, but thankfully the prodigal returned when reason created, uh, the reason rack as a VST. And yes. I just chef's kiss. That was exactly what I was uh, what I was looking for because all of the things that I loved about Reason, mm -hmm. uh, the 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 actual DAW itself, like if there was a Mount Rushmore, it would be I, I guess kind of like not even up there. The sounds I loved the the board and the SSL board and all that stuff, but um, but having Reason rack that n knowing you're not a representative, blah blah blah, but that <laughs> that feels like a tectonic shift. In thinking for what was then, I guess at the time, propeller heads. I think they were still propeller they, heads at that time. Or I, had they had they shifted over to Reason Studios? They might have done that switch at the same exact time. It was Reason Eleven that um, was when the Reason Rack plugin became a, an option, and uh, I think that might have been the same time that they switched from propeller head to Reason Studios. Now, now how, how did that resonate throughout the community? The fact that hey, you can buy it as a plugin and. Did you have folks like screaming, you're abandoning the DAW, or folks who are like me, who are like, praise Jesus, right? You're back. Yeah. Well, it won't surprise you or viewers to hear that uh, anything you do with the, a tool someone uses is going to invite every spectrum of opinion. Yeah. So yes, uh, there was, there was certainly that was represented. Um, there was people that thought, 
And there's still people that think that there's some nefarious like six year plan to like walk away from all this. And <laughs> like I don't four, quite know the motivation. Chess, right? <laughs> yeah. It's like, Oh, they're going to do this and then they're going to do that. And then they're going to do this and then it's going to all be over. And it's like, well, wait, why? No, that's, you know, the goal is to, to grow and get music makers to come to reason, not to, right. you know, uh, sort of, so, sort of sneak out of the room when no one's looking. <laughs> and so there was certainly, there was some of that con- conspiratorial mm. thinking. There was people who, um, worried about where the focus would fall you know mm. it's like are you know are you are you going to be just focusing on the on the rack plugin and not focusing on the daw i think at least as a daw user who's you know because i still primarily produce mm-hmm. in the reason daw um it, that hasn't been the case so i think people kind of once that time a little time passed they realized that it wasn't not it wasn't being backburnered yeah. And um and the, the big thing was that you know you talk about the Daw Wars and that was the most fun for me and I think other reason users figured out that like oh this totally changes the the conversation because yeah. in the Daw Wars the, the Daw Wars is rooted in these conversations that we all have as musician to musician, friend to friend, right? And if you're using FL Studio and I'm using Live, it's a good chance that part of our friendship is based on kind of ribbing you and trying to convince you to come <laughs> right, to my right. side of the fence and <laughs> you're trying to get me to go to your side of the fence. And it's all like, oh, does, yeah, can you do this in Live? Oh, can you do this in FL Studio? <laughs> and and that's really what the Doll Wars is, you know, is, is that sort of uh, friendly joking, but also real competition in terms of people trying to evangelize and convert people to their side. Right. Now, the conversation for reason, that's, or any of these, it, that's a really hard conversation. You know, it's like, oh, hey, you've got eight years invested in uh, working in Logic and you know Logic Pro inside and out. Well, guess what? There's this one thing that live can do. And so you should relearn and do your whole DAW workflow. Oh, and also like maybe some of your plugins aren't going to work, you know, right. and like it's, right. it's a really hard conversation to convert someone yeah. to switch from one DAW to the other. And the thing that became really fun about the Reason Rack plugin for me as someone who interacts with the community so much is the conversation didn't become that. The conversation became, do you love your DAW? We're so happy you do. Here is something new for your DAW that's going to like level up what you can do with the environment that you already work in. And yeah, it, it, it was it was it really felt like coming home, ha- having all of these tools, which I had spent so many years, but I just had to set aside because you know I'm, I I teach logic all day every day, you know, for 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 students, and so it was uh, it was borderline academic malpractice for me not to get as good with logic as I was with Reason. So, uh, so when I could install it as a plugin i'm like oh, oh yeah. there's maelstrom oh there's the combinator oh right. there's the inline mixer oh it's like um like slipping out on a pair of old jeans absolutely there is i mean that that coming home thing that's something i hear from a lot of people you know uh we used to get one of the biggest feature requests that used to come into the the mail room over in stockholm at the reason studios headquarters was things like for the love of God, can you please just make Scream Force Distortion a plugin? Just make just that. Right. I, I miss it. <laughs> yes. I'm over in Pro Tools, but I want Scream Force so bad, you know. And and for a million obvious reasons, that it was not hitting the top of the priority list, uh, you know, over in the, with the R and D department. Um, but but all of a sudden it was like, oh, then this welcome home thing happens, and so now we're hearing instead of that, we're hearing like. Oh, for the love of God, thank you so much for putting Scream 4 back into Pro Tools for me, you know? and Yeah, uh, I I mean, just like the Kong drum designer, which was way ahead of its time. I've got one of these guys. Yeah. And and I remember seeing this on the Kong. I'm like, well, 16 pads. That makes perfect sense. And and Uh, NPC guys had known that for for years. That's such a perfect, like, micro uh, demonstration of that same ethos I was talking about where, like, you look at Kong Drum Designer as an NPC guy, and you don't need the manual. It's like, yep. oh, okay, but I, this yeah. is my that is my workflow. I know that it's that same sort of genius of the the hardware metaphor they have with all that yeah, stuff. So, yeah. so I am so glad to have kind of reason back in my life, and they're doing amazing things. The object synth is groundbreaking, next level. It still hurts my brain, I, and I've watched <laughs> your tutorial like several times. I'm like, I it was so lucid, and now it is gone. <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, so I got to watch it again at half speed, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, object um, is, you know, I mean, physical modeling, it's a, it's, it, it is a, a true physical modeling synthesizer. And that's probably the, the type of synthesis technology that we all have the least experience with, you know? Right. And yeah. so it is, and it's a whole different paradigm. It's so, ab it's so abstract. It's not yeah. like, here's a sound, manipulate sound. You Correct. Know, here's a sample. Here. Right. So, Which so, is so, by design, you know, I mean, the, the, usually that's sort of, a pitfall that a lot of physical modeling synthesizer designs fall into is they try to condense what is a really chaotic, like algorithmic model, the way it actually works, you know, in the, on the tech DSP side is really complicated. And so they try to sort of like pull it into these macros and these sort of like physical abstractions that make sense. So you, you end up choosing, you know, uh, I want to take a, a, a plastic resonator and put a, a, animal skin on it and I want to hit it with a with a metal rod you know and that will make a sound but it doesn't be so much of the actual sound design has been taken away from you with these sort of like relatable abstractions in mm -hmm. physical modeling that you don't actually usually get really great results and so that was to me when I saw object the genius of object was that sure it's been it's been made approachable I mean the guys that do the the UX design are geniuses but yeah. they're still giving you access to the true physical modeling algorithmic overtone and and the whole the the thing that makes physical modeling work the way it does impact exciters and all that stuff they're giving you access to the actual controls of that and lo and behold if you are either a physical modeling genius or have enough time to experiment and play with it and kind of hone in <laughs> on it, you can make wildly realistic uh, models of stuff. So, so you know? question for you. As the resident guy who has to communicate this to the yeah. masses, yeah. when you see something like object come uh -huh. at you, how, what is your approach to learning these new sense, to learning uh, like how, how to work them into your workflow yeah. beyond just, hey, these presets are good, I guess, and then right. that never becomes anything else. Uh, right. how, do you, how do you really dig into uh, any new instrument like that? That's a, that's a good question um, because I probably have a process and I probably, I probably won't do a great job of explaining it right now because I've never fully thought about it. I can tell you part one is um, I... I don't get brought in on the earliest design phases um, because things change and I, I can actually get sort of wrong impressions that linger. Like, mm. in fact, I'll give an example for objects. I actually got, um, I didn't get this communicated from the actual product department that was designing object, but some other people in the company kind of passed me a little like a rumor of like, hey, they're working on a new um, instrument and it's going to be a physical modeling instrument for doing um, me struck metallic objects. Which is like, that's true in a small pie wedge of what Object does, but <laughs> right. Object does so much more. That's not what know? this is about, right. And so when I actually then did kind of get looped in to start like, you know, getting briefed on what it is and, and working up kind of my content plans and stuff, um, I had this, I had to like, it took me a couple weeks to like separate myself from the bias of, oh, it's a struck metallic object instrument. You know, mm -hmm. I was thinking, oh, okay, we'll do stuff with gamelons. Like maybe I'll go to Indonesia and we'll record gamelons and make a video. And, you know, I was sort of thinking strictly in that thing and it was it wasn't until matthias who's the the product manager for reason uh and i were having a conversation and he kind of caught me he was like you know why are you fixated on this one sliver of what <laughs> why it do does? you keep talking about metal yeah. right? so so for that reason and that's a demonstration why i generally don't do that i i come in when it's more fully baked and and, right. and matthias and i will have meetings he'll show it to me um first in a kind of general way and then um, I'll start working with it a little bit and then I'll meet up with him again and I'll sort of go like, here's where I'm not like, explain to me why this works this way or what's the value of this feature? Like, I'm just not seeing it yet. And, and Matthias, uh, he's, like I said, he's the product manager for a reason. So he makes a lot of those big development decisions. Mm -hmm. Matthias started as, um, you know, a spry young lad uh, joining reason. He was, again, same thing as me. He was a reason user that like through, like in ways that he wasn't going to question, they they hired him to be a, a product specialist, a demo guy. So he would go out to, you know, the UK or to other places in Europe and do demonstrations in, mm. you know, music stores and stuff. And conferences and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, conferences. Yeah, all that kind of stuff. And uh, the thing that maybe to his frustration, because for all of us, our sake, is he's still utterly amazing at demoing a product uh, or demoing a plugin or something like that and showing you in a very natural way, what it can do and how great it can be at it. 
And so he's second to none of that. So he's like my entry. Like he he demos it for me and I get into it. Right. Then I start working with it myself. And um, for me, usually my the thing I come at it with is I want to I want to break down for someone what's happening without being like annoyingly technical about it, but I want them to understand on a fundamental level what's happening. And so I, I'm right. sure I did that in the object video, but the one that comes to mind, for example, is um, Reason Studios made a synth called Algorithm. It's an FM synthesizer. Mm -hmm. And it's like, uh, I, I think that one is maybe the one I'm most happy with how I explained just enough FM synthesis for you to understand how to use it in Algorithm without getting in this whole rabbit hole of FM synthesis and and what it is and the the nuances of it. The uh, but mass, the thing about right? <laughs> the thing about uh, algorithm is that it has this really amazing again the UX guys like amazing. They it has this great interface where you can really see FM synthesis algorithm routing in a way that you never used to on like a DX7 and stuff like that. It was always mm -hmm. I mean you did but it was it was a little graphic that was a weird like map of an algorithm and it looked right. weird, but, but you can really get hands on in algorithm, the plugin. So, um, yeah. So, so for me, that's sort of the balance is like, I want to take people who know nothing about what I'm about to tell you, give you just enough that you can now approach this instrument and now let's make some cool music with it. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, uh, you know, we, we've talked for half an hour about reason, but reason is really just part of who you are as a composer, as an artist. And I was very pleasantly surprised to learn that you are a very accomplished banjo player, <laughs> which I mean, isn't every reason user, isn't that, isn't, yeah. aren't we all right? I mean, I have a banjo <laughs> ukulele here, you know, hanging on the wall in the background, but I mean, we're talking like legitimate banjo player. And for me, I am completely fascinated because I, if there's a Venn diagram of like, types of musicians, right? Reason, EDM user or composer, banjo player. That's a very, 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 very sliver of overlap. You know, but that's true. Yeah. Help me understand how, how your brain kind of occupies both and where yeah. do you see the overlap and, yeah. and, uh, and yeah, just unpack that for You me. know, in terms of the overlap, anyone can see the overlap on my Instagram because I have a, there was a thing that actually was a, a through reason. There's a reason user named Top Talk. He's a, a house producer in Sweden. And he did a little like remix challenge uh, partnership with the reason community. And everybody was doing uh, remixes of the song he had called New Levels. And I, as a joke on a live stream or announcing the challenge or something, said like, ah, maybe I'll do a banjo remix. Because the reason community, when I host live streams, they see the banjos in the background and they get all excited about <laughs> kind of making fun of it, you know, like some of them, some of them get it. Yeah, it's kind of like a punchline, you yeah, know. Yeah, it's, you know, accordion, bagpipes, banjo, like, you know, it's not part of, yeah, it's at the, the kids' it. table in terms of like the... Yeah, yeah. The deliverance weekend. didn't do us any favors either. It did not, it did not, <laughs> no. So, but I actually did a remix of the Top Talk song that I called the Banjo Remix, where I actually did fuse, you know, like sort of modern electronic reason production with a top line from the banjo. And actually, it was kind of cool. I mean, it's, it's not going to take the world by storm and be a whole new genre, but it did work better than I thought. <laughs> yeah, Banjo um, House, right? I mean, yeah. uh, it, it could be a thing. It could be a thing, but it just, it just fascinates me. And I think points to a bigger picture of, um, you know, that... Music is music is yeah. music. And right, so right. having space in your consciousness for, hey, I'm over here, I, I, I write lo-fi, but I also play the flute, you right, know, and that's right. totally that's totally good. And how it enriches one another. So like learning Certainly. banjo enriches your work in the DAW, which enriches you uh, uh, in, in the banjo, uh, in the banjo space and in the folk space, you know, just... Yeah. Just a few minutes before this recording, you released a, a, a video, a duet. It was beautiful, yeah. beautiful singing. I mean, you're a fantastic singer, you know. And you and the the the, the singer are out there, kind of in a field. You know, she's playing That's right. guitar, and her you're name playing. is Michaela May. She's a wonderful yeah. singer. Yeah. yeah, so good. It's so good, and is it feels diametrically opposite from like I'm making like a house beat. And yeah. that's so great you say that because that is exactly it. And and in terms of what brought me to the banjo and brought me to uh, acoustic music, I mean, I was always kind of, I was raised with that influence to some degree. You know, was my, my parents were into Cat Stevens and, and Arlo mm. Guthrie and, you know, there was sort of this folk uh, influence growing up. But uh, the truth is that I, that diametric opposition you talk about uh, is exactly 
the value for me in the the music I play, the banjo and the acoustic roots kind of music I play, because um, w- the way it started, I was I started learning banjo and I was you know kind of was getting into it, and I went to um, a thing which is very common within that music scene is is jamming, group jamming. You get together with friends and you uh, or people you don't even know. You just get together with you know random people at a at a local community center or whatever, and you know you have fifteen people sitting in a little circle. And you play songs together. And the that style of music is such, and that style of, that tradition of community jamming is such that you you don't all know the same songs, but the, the music is such and your skills develop in such that you can kind of learn them on the fly. And as someone who's leading the song, the person singing and leading the song, you can guide people in real time on where the chord changes are coming and 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 so it's a it's a very improvisational um style of music. But I went to my first jam or first couple jams and i would go in the evening i would do that and then the next day i'd be working in reason again i'd work in reason all week and then on you know the thursday i'd go to another jam and what i came to realize was that i needed that jam Mm. because my work in reason and i'm sure people can relate to this you know everything you do when you're working in a daw is about exacting nature you're you're either timing things to simply time code for a (laughs) cue or you're working to a click grid uh, you're you're quantizing your things to make them perfect, or you're 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 deliberately but very exactingly not quantizing them to try and get human feel. You're very aware that everything you're doing is for keeps. It's going to go out into the world. It's going to be judged by your peers. It's going to be judged <laughs> by you know the the audio leads on a project or, yeah. or the directors of a film <laughs> or whatever. Mar- the marketplace, right? It counts. Everything counts, and it's it's important, and it's got to be just right. And so that's your whole world all day long is spent doing that. And then I'd go to the jam, and it, b- without deliberately realizing it, but I suddenly picked up on this, suddenly, now I'm in a room, I'm with 15 people, we're making music, and as we make the music, it just drifts off into the ether and it's gone. And if someone makes a mistake, yeah. that's okay. It and matter. And the, nobody is judging it except us, who are just, and the, it's not judgment, it's, we're just here, we're making this music just to enjoy this moment in real time, and then we're all going to go home and it's just gone. And that that sort of flip side to the exacting work I was doing in, in reason and in DAW work, you know, and music production work was, it was just such a nice little Mm. like head corrective mindset to be in. It sort of reconnected me to why we all get into music Mm. in the first place, which is we just love making music and the expression of it. And it's not that we love, you know, like some of that real exacting sort of, you know, transient well, it's detection a, and stuff. You it's know? a slippery slope. As soon as you start, you know, looking to make a living making music, yeah. you com- you're you commodifying your creativity, then uh, you run the risk of just squeezing the joy out of it because you got cues to make, and especially in exactly. the production music world, right? Exactly. Or we, don't, we don't even have the benefit of like seeing our name on a credit slide, right? We're just <laughs> in the background, like making royalties. We're underneath some scene yep. of a cooking show, you know, and yep. our names will never be... But when you think like that, it can wear you down. It can wear down your your muse, Absolutely. wear down your spirit if you want to. So I love that perspective of having some kind of outlet which connects you to the uh, the the primal or primary <laughs> feral reason <laughs> that 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 got you excited about being a musician and being right. Uh, and it and in it music. feeds back into it too. You know, yeah. you I I come away from I. I I, if I actually did like a quantitative analysis of my productivity and efficiency, I would be, lay money on the fact that the days that I work after, you know, if I'm playing a gig or if I'm, uh, you know, uh, having a jam or just working and rehearsing, doing some acoustic thing with somebody, like that next production day is a more inspired and uh, not efficient sounds that now we're talking about commoditization again, but like more satisfying, I guess we could say more, you know, I'm, I'm actually, my heart's in it a little more than it is on the days when I'm like, you know, five days into like iterating on revisions, you know, and it's like, Oh, that's not quite right. Yeah. 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 You know, that's, that's more just like, okay, let's get this one done and get the invoice out, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Finding those, um, those uh, oases, uh, uh, your creative oases that can help uh, buoy your 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 soul through yeah. through a living making music totally in a, in a weird way I, I don't know if this analogy is going to hold up at all but it's almost like you know 
married couples that have date night to kind of like continually mm-hmm. rekindle their thing. You know, it's like for me, acoustic music is my musical date night. And then I, I, I love can, that. <laughs> oh, I love that. So I encourage any of our viewers and listeners, you know, what, what are you doing? Um, to uh, to to rekindle, re- you know, rekindle the spark. Um, <laughs> That's right. because, With yourself, <laughs> be- right? Exactly, uh, because I mean, it it is work. You know, as soon as you ask somebody to give you money for the thing that came, you know, just popped out of your head, mm-hmm. right? You've got to meet them where they're at, and they get to assign value. And there's a whole philosophical dis- discussion on that, right? But being able to, uh, like, right. I love what you said, being able to go and make ephemeral music, mm-hmm. which is just, it only exists in that moment and then is gone. It's not yeah. commodified. And, and, you know, and the, you don't have to play banjo to do that. I mean, you yeah. can, you know, there are technologies like, um, it, yeah, what's it called? Ableton Link, I think it's called, the, the yeah. sync technology that, you know, anybody with a, a phone app that supports it and your friend with a, uh, you know, with a laptop and stuff, you guys can make music in your technological domains yeah. that is that just you're not doing it with yeah. any sort of longevity in mind and it's worth doing you know yeah I, it, I i love that perspective man i i really really love that perspective uh for me uh, i like I did an episode a while back about I'm learning guitar and how it's rekindled the the joy of having something new, you know, because if you're, you know, you know, you're, you've been making videos for 10 years and all that, there, it, then it just kind of becomes grindy being a professional drummer and all of that stuff. Sure. There's like, there's not, there's not a lot of new territory to, to explore. Right. But uh, learning guitar has way pushed me out of my comfort zone and it's having, uh, effects in the other the other parts of my creative right. life. Right. You know, um, one of the things I think is um particularly for people that are kind of starting out on that journey, I mean, if you if you are lucky enough to have so much success, you move past this, but um and no, it's not entirely. Um in terms of like keeping your love for this, what you lose in the beginning is you lose the ability to say no to anything. You have no <laughs> discretion over the projects. You know, if something right. comes your way, yes, I will do it. Right. If you're overloaded with projects and something extra comes your way, I'll do that too. I'll That's make right. it work. Um, I don't need to sleep. I'll figure it out. And so, you know, when you're talking about kind of getting into that grind, like that's part of the psychological thing too, because you, you, you started making music with only discretion, just figuring out like, I'm just going to do the things that excite me and I like. And then suddenly it's like, oh, actually, you know, this, you know, this holiday commercial, maybe is not, I wouldn't have been voluntarily been doing this for, <laughs> out of passion, but I got to do right. it because I'm well, trying to a, make it's this a, work. It's a bell curve, isn't it? You know, when you start off, you just don't know what you don't know. And then yep. you, you get involved and then you start getting gigs. And then there's this big chunk where you're still getting better, but you're also, like you said, you can't say no to everything. Right. But on the other side of that, that's when you can say, okay, this is for me. I'm doing it. I'm And, and so... Right. I, I love that perspective. Um, and uh, by, by the way, if folks want to uh, connect with you, um, how, how can they how can they reach? Maybe they want to uh, to follow your uh, banjo journey on Instagram. I mean, who where can they fo- where can they find you? <laughs> sure. So yeah, uh, you can find me on Instagram. I'm at Ryan Harlan with an underscore because I was a little too late to grab the uh, non underscore version. <laughs> so it's Ryan Harlan as an I N. A lot of times people will spell Harlan with a H A R L A N, but right. it's H A R L I N uh, underscore. Uh, so that's that's where I'm on uh, Instagram. Um, if you if you want to see like the DAW related or, or production, more of that technical stuff, um, the best place to actually follow me is to follow Reason Studios because that's where I do all that stuff. So that's at Reason Studios on Instagram and Twitter and and all the all the socials. And, um, and you're also you're also you also teach banjo at like uh, like camps and that kind of thing, right? I do. Yeah, yeah. That's Talk a, a, a relatively that. new relatively new thing for me to move into. I've been uh, working, there's a music camp here in Northern California called Walker Creek Music Camp that I've uh, worked at in the capacity of being a teacher's assistant where they'll bring in some teacher of of national renown and mm-hmm. I'll help out in the, in the classroom as a sort of assistant to them. Uh, November was the first time, I, I guess I got called up to the majors and uh, <laughs> they brought me on to be the, the actual on-staff teacher for that camp. Uh, that was the first camp that I've taught in person, which was a wonderful experience because a lot of the work that I do, and it's particularly with reason that content, a lot of that's music education work, but it's fa- it's faceless. I'm I'm you know I'm just like now I'm talking into a lens yep. and people are watching it, but we, I don't actually have the personal interaction with a room full of people. So it's super fun to to do the same effectively that same skill of trying to make complicated things graspable, but to actually watch 
the head's not up and down when they get yep. it or the oh faces yeah, you know the aha uh, moments the aha yeah, moments yeah I, it was yep. super fun um i plan to do a lot more of that and there's a a, a camp uh i can't announce yet but there's another there'll be another banjo camp that it looks like it's it's nearly official uh that i'll be teaching at in june as well uh, yeah for, uh, of course we're gonna have links to ryan's uh insta as the kids <laughs> instagram and the youtube channel uh as well as to the uh, walker creek music camp if you are interested in that uh, the next one's coming up in april will you That's be right. at that one. Um, I'll be at that uh, one. Assistant? I will be at that one. Assisting? I'll be. I'll be assisting. Uh, I don't know if they've announced to me yet, so maybe I won't. <laughs> Actually, by the time I think it will be announced by the time okay. this would go out. So, we'll, right. if, if anyone uh, is into the banjo world, Steve Boffman is going to be the uh, banjo teacher at Walker Creek in April, and he's a phenomenal just human being, but also a phenomenal teacher. So, I'll and, be uh, thrilled to assist him. Yeah, we're gonna have all those links. Follow him on Instagram if you want to uh, to look at that. Uh, look for that other camp. But uh, Ryan, man, it was an absolute pleasure talking to you today. Thank you so much for your time. And I wish you all the success and uh, congratulations on, uh, on, uh, on your success. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to go listen to some more of your banjo stuff. It's really good. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much for having me. Once again, a huge thanks to Ryan for joining me on the podcast. And of course, we're going to have all his links in the description. So please be sure to check that out. Uh, but that is going to do it for me today. Once again, a huge word of thanks to the family, friends, and neighbor subscribers of 52Qs who really keep all this going. They pay their actual real life money and they keep everything going, the channel, the community, the podcast. Thank you so much. Please know that none of this would be possible without your help. And so if you want to join us, head over to 52Qs.com. Subscriptions start at around four bucks a month. Uh, you definitely want to tune in next week where I am joined by 52Qs family member and former professional golfer, Shane Jensen. And we're going to have a chat. We're going to talk about what can we learn about the production music industry or what are some of the lessons we can learn from golf? Now, I am a terrible golfer, but how does being a professional athlete, specifically in golf, translate to the skills you would uh, need for production music? So we're going to welcome Shane Jensen to the podcast. But that is going to do it for me this week. Uh, I hope you've had an amazing week, and I am looking forward to hearing great things about your next week, your week four. But just remember, friends, I know, trust, and believe that the universe has amazing plans just for you. Until next time, peace. The 52 Cues Podcast is copyright 2024, 818 Studios, all rights reserved. The music played on the podcast is copyright of their respective owners and is used with permission and for educational purposes only. For more information, including joining the community or becoming a member subscriber of 52 Cues, head over to 52 cuescom